I think we're in a very, very dangerous moment. Election integrity. Legal voter suppression. Radical indifference. More tribalism. Foreign election interference. You don't have a natural cognitive defense against this stuff. There are incredibly motivated groups of people with a particular agenda, and the social ecosystem has given them the tools to reach other people to spread that agenda. That can be anything from a terrorist organization reaching out to recruit, like we saw with ISIS, or the Internet Research Agency reaching out to exploit societal divisions, like we saw in the 2016 election. As we saw in the 2016 election, governments are also increasingly figuring out we can actually use these social media platforms to manipulate public opinion to our own end, to spread disinformation, to spread propaganda, and to really gin up um, hatred sometimes against vulnerable populations or the political opposition or whatever it is. If you think about presidential campaigns from years past, they use TV and they used you know, radio and other media that was the same for every person who heard or saw those advertisements. But if you're thinking about how advertising works on Facebook or, or Twitter or, or other social media, they can actually customize that ad to very small groups of people who all have, say, the same personality type. And that enabled campaigns to manipulate very small segments of the, of the population to do very specific things, whether it was to vote for a particular candidate or to raise money or, or potentially even to not vote at all. These campaigns are so well executed, so well done. You don't have a natural cognitive defense against this stuff. You just are going to take what you see credulously and particularly if it appeals to your biases, which it should if they're doing their job targeting the right people with the right content, you're going to be receptive to it. This is not a future society that is compatible with democracy, that is compatible with human freedom that is compatible with the most elemental sense of human agency. Democracy isn't simply the option to vote for candidate A or candidate B. It is being well informed about what the candidates actually stand for. That's what we're at, we're at risk of losing. Having outside parties interfere in our election is just a horrible thing. Voting is the most basic building block of democracy. And if we don't have that, what do we have? Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Max Steinman. I am the director of the Impact Campaign for The Social Dilemma, and I'm thrilled to be serving as the moderator for today's discussion. The clip that just played featured some unreleased footage from the film, giving us a jumping off point for the next stop on our virtual tour. Digital rights are, are human rights. We've been hosting these conversations since September as a way to explore the many dilemmas raised in the film more deeply and, and invite others into the conversation as well. Before we get started, I want to first acknowledge that I'm joining you today from Denver, the ancestral land of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho, and offer gratitude to the land and the people who have stewarded it throughout generations. I'm also grateful to be joined today by an amazing group of panelists, people that have been working at the intersection of technology and human rights for many, many years. I'd like to quickly introduce them one by one. We're joined by Sophia Noble. Sophia is the author of the best-selling book, Algorithms of Oppression. She is an associate professor at UCLA in the Department of Information Studies where she serves as the co-founder and co-director of the Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. Jessica Deere is here with us as well. Jessica is the director of Ranking Digital Rights, an organization that works to promote freedom of expression and privacy on the internet by creating global standards and incentives for companies to respect and protect users' rights. She's also an affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society and co-founder and former executive director of the Arab digital rights organization, SMEX. And we also have Rasha Abdul Rahim joining us. 
Rasha is acting director of Amnesty Tech, a globally distributed team of advocates, hackers, researchers, and technologists at Amnesty International, working to ensure that advancements in technology benefit rather than erode human rights. She also heads up the artificial intelligence and big data team, managing global research, policy, and campaigning on issues including the business model of big tech, privacy, surveillance, and platform accountability. So our last event was back in October in the lead up to the US presidential election, where we focused on the threat that social media posed to election integrity and to democracy around the world. Here we are in February in the aftermath of a violent attack on the US Capitol fueled by social media. And now this is sparking heated public debate about how and perhaps if we can govern these platforms while protecting our human rights. But Sophia, I know in your book, you talked about how after the 2016 election, Google was displaying false information about the 2016 election results in its, in its top uh, pages. So this, this goes back well, well beyond uh, the current presidential election. So to bring each of our panelists into the conversation, I'd like to pose a question to each of you, uh, maybe starting off with Sophia. Uh, the role of social media in the attacks generated lots of, lots of uh, media attention, but is there a danger in looking at the capital attacks as an isolated incident? Well, I think for sure, and thanks, Max. It's great to be here with you. Uh, for sure, there's no way we can frame up the capital attacks as an isolated event when we have um, years of documentation around um, racist violence, um, calls for ethnic cleansing and genocide around the world. Um, it might be a newer phenomena here in the United States to see social media used to organize white militias and then finally make it to the news uh, at 6 p.m. But I think what we want to remember is that many of these platforms have been implicated in civil and human rights and, and sovereign rights abuses for more than a decade. And um, it, it's very important that we link up these um, harms and these crimes, quite frankly, um, to each other. because. We're in an unprecedented time where I think it's uh, very difficult to apprehend the way in which uh, tech companies are profiting so significantly from business activities that, in fact, foment these kinds of harms. Absolutely. And Rasha, I'd love to hear from you in the work that you're doing at Amnesty, how this plays out there. Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I, I want to second what, what Safia just just pointed to, which is the fact that, you know, that that Donald Trump was essentially deplatformed, was unprecedented primarily from the perspective of, of the global north, right? Because numerous politicians from Lebanon to Myanmar have been banned from these platforms. And actually many more who arguably use these platforms to incite human rights abuses remain online. You know, prime example is President Duterte of uh, the Philippines and President Bolsonaro of, of Brazil. Um, and although social media companies often claim that their policies are, are, are consistent or they're applied consistently around the world, this actually doesn't seem to be the case. Um, and we've also seen through our work at Amnesty International, human rights defenders, activists, researchers and journalists and, and members of, of persecuted communities um, regularly facing harassment and threats online um, and then the, the platforms often you know finding themselves not able to respond to these and not taking down tweets and posts that clearly violate platform um, guidelines and so this is precisely why I think more transparency is, is needed around the way that these platforms enforce their, their guidelines more transparency is needed about how the decisions are taken um, and really it needs to be grounded in a, in a human rights um, based approach. Um, and, you know, just to also say that other countries are, are watching very closely what's what's happened in, in the States and thinking, look, if the if Twitter and Facebook can deplatform you know, the president of the United States where they're based, what does that mean for, for other leaders? And we're seeing now this sort of pushback and, and testing the boundaries of, you know, what you can ask the social media companies to do. And we're seeing governments around the world instrumentalizing the censorship 
that uh, platforms like Twitter and Facebook are able to, to put in place for their own interests. And a prime example of this is, of course, what's happening in, in India with the, with the farmers' protests and Twitter pushing back against uh, the government's um, demands to, to take down certain content and, um, and to, to, to censor speech. And so I think this raises a larger question about how platforms deal with, with, with speech of, of politicians. Uh, and it also sh shows the need to, to rethink these policies and, and to look at you know, whether giving politicians free reign to violate policies is, is actually contributing to harm. And also important to look at how this plays out in, in other countries around the world. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it sounds like there's ultimately a consistency issue and we're seeing a lot of a lot of flip flopping from these platforms. Um, I wanted to turn now to Jessica because the work that you do at Ranking Digital Rights, you sort of have this broad view of what's happening at the digital at, at, at these social media platforms. Um, so I'm curious what you're seeing and and the the danger in looking at this as sort of just this isolated event. Thanks, Max, um, and thanks for having me. Um, Ranking Digital Rights. Uh, uh, briefly evaluates the world's most powerful internet platforms and telecommunications companies according to their disclosed commitments um, to protect and respect users' rights to free expression and privacy primarily and, and increasingly non-discrimination as well. What we've been seeing, and we're, we're getting ready to launch our fifth index, um, or we, we've just launched our fifth fifth index. Um, and, and so we have a, sort of a, a big picture view of, of, of both improvements that companies have made and also um, a lot of where there's a lot of room for improvement. And specifically with regard to the kind of amplification and content moderation issues that we're seeing with, um, in, in, or that we've seen in the wake of the, uh, or identified in the wake of the capital attacks, um, there's definitely a lot more that companies can do. Um, I guess in terms of whether or not this should be seen as an isolated incident, my, my instinct is, of course, not that, that this isn't the first time that this happened, as Sophia and Rasha have outlined, but that it's interesting that it takes a, a political figure um, to sort of galvanize a discussion around the consistency of platform rules, whereas what we should really be asking is... If, how can we protect the ordinary, the rights of ordinary users to access and sort of participate in a public sphere that supports both informing and including them in democratic processes, rather than sort of uh, having a business model and algorithmic and targeted advertising systems that actually have been diminishing democracy itself? Um, I think consistency in rules enforcement is definitely one of the um, challenges that we're facing. But I think the business model of these companies and the way that they're using algorithms to prioritize and rank and recommend content, um, uh, sort of pointing to what Kathy O'Neill says about um, the information algorithms, um, is, is definitely eroding uh, trust and, and, and our ability to, to participate effectively in these systems. Um, and and that um, one of the things that we found in, in this year's index is that companies are really not disclosing anything at all um, about how these systems work. And, um, and, and we're pushing them to, to tell us more. Great, thank you so much. Uh, you know, something that brings up for me is that the lens through which a lot of this is being projected now, at least for the average person, is through this lens of content moderation. You know, what, what stays up, what comes down, um, what can governments mandate that people take down either in the absence of regulation or maybe once we have more regulation. Um, but all of this feels very subjective ultimately. And it's also kind of nibbling around the edges in terms of, uh, it's nibbling around the edges rather than getting at the, the root cause. Um, so, you know, what, what implications might this, um, this content moderation lens have and, and, and where does it fall short? Like, do we need to fundamentally change the underlying business model in order to, to see the change that we need and to, to really protect human rights? Um, I'm curious, maybe I'll go actually back to Jessica, because I know that with Facebook, they, in the last year or so, 
um, put in place their Facebook oversight board. And I wonder how that sort of shows up in your report and, and, and in the kind of transparency of what they're doing, knowing that ultimately they're only bubbling up a very few of these, of these cases and they actually aren't um, governing that oversight board sort of objectively with a third party. It's all sort of done, done internally. Um, I don't actually think I'll have to double check, but I don't think that Facebook's oversight board is a is technically a factor in how we evaluate content moderation on the platforms, um, given that it is supposed to be independent. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, we have opinions about it, but more specifically, the kinds of things that we ask for um, in, in our ranking is, is, is there a content uh, moderation policy that's clear and accessible? Um, does the company do transparency reporting, transparency reporting on, on content moderation? And, um, and uh, do they report on government demands? And, and most importantly, are they reporting on their enforcement of their own policies? And we see quite frequently that they are not doing effective reporting uh, or trans they're not doing effective reporting on how they're enforcing their own policies. Um, and one of the things that we say is, you know, you can have rules for how you moderate content. We know that um, it's both moderated through algorithms and, and um, with some human review. Um, we know that there are mistakes that are that, that will be made, um, but companies then also need to provide um, a means of remedy uh, or a means of grievance and remedy for users. And, and we're seeing a lot of shortcomings in this as well. And um, Sophia Rasha, um Sophia, maybe you have thoughts here on sort of this content moderation approach, um, whack-a-mole approach versus really looking at the underlying business model of these platforms um, and, and how we got to where we are. Sure. I mean, I think one of the things we want to remember is that the part of the business model of many of these technology companies is to obfuscate content moderation. In fact, for um, more than 20 years, technology companies have denied that there was an, indeed content moderation happening at all. And of course, that is part of their own logic of not being responsible for the kinds of media that moves through their media platforms. And this is, a, in the United States, one of the key debates right now is around Section 230 and whether platforms are responsible for the kind of media that moves through their platforms. Denying content moderation is one of the ways that you, again, obfuscate because um, you know until about a decade ago, we didn't even know that content moderators uh, existed at the scale as a kind of a, a cottage industry, which of course now is a, a global workforce. Um, I, of course, I know about this because of the groundbreaking work that my research collaborator, Sarah Roberts, did um, for, you know, again, a decade, helping us understand that this process was even happening. Now, what's more important, I think, um, to learn from content moderators themselves is that um, they actually have an incredible amount of insight into these companies and their business practices. So when we talk about getting to the root cause, well, if every single content moderator is basically silenced through non-disclosure agreements, can't help us understand the logics uh, of the kind of opaque moderating policies, then um, you know the public loses out one more time on an ability to kind of apprehend the problems. So I think you know we want to be thinking about things like whistleblower protections for content moderators around the world, um, the degree to which they can help us understand um, why they're making certain types of choices. Uh, you know, I've read many reports out from moderators through Professor Roberts' work, and, you know, they themselves ask the questions of the companies, um, why is it that we, for example, take down videos of animals being tortured or mutilated, but we leave up um, blackface or racist um, derogatory uh, propaganda? There's a kind of a whole host of questions that are beyond just the kind of um, the texture of the work, which of course is important, how they're making these decisions, what their labor conditions are, how much technology or software is being used. But I think there's also a more fundamental question about what are the values upon which 
these decisions are made. And one of the reasons why we haven't had a lot of declaration from social media companies about their values, and I would include Google in this in terms of YouTube, is that they are, um, they are not interested in declaring their values and uh, because that would it would create a whole new Pandora's box of regulation that they would be responsible and accountable to again, in terms of section 230. So I think, you know, the, it's a complex uh, set of um, concerns that we need to look at. And um, I think these uh, fundamentally are tied to things like a, a global backlash against civil rights, you know, a, a rise of um, white ethno-nationalism, a rise of authoritarian regimes and governments around the world, and the degree to which these companies profit handsomely from that. Yeah, absolutely. Not to mention the human rights uh, abuses faced by these workers themselves who, you know, probably don't have the proper protections in place for the kind of content that they're being sort of exposed to on a regular basis. Um, Rasha, I thought I could turn to you now. I think we've touched a little bit on, uh, you know, sort of freedom of speech and the tension between that and preventing harmful speech on these platforms. Um, but there's all sorts of other human rights uh, harms and abuses that can crop up on these platforms when we start looking through the lens of privacy. And um, I think it's important here to, to not only think about privacy in terms of, um, you know, sort of surveillance um, as we think about it traditionally, but also uh, uh, surveillance capitalism and the kind of data that's being collected on us without us even knowing, and not just what's being collected, but really like how it's being used against us. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, you know, how Amnesty thinks about surveillance capitalism, about surveillance um, and, and the data that's being collected on us just being scraped so regularly as, as a human rights abuse that needs to be addressed. Absolutely. Yes, it's um, it's in 2019, Amnesty published a report um, talking about what we call the surveillance giants and laying out the case for why their business model is inherently incompatible with the right to privacy. And not only that, but the initial abuse of the right to privacy then has knock on effects on other rights, including the rights to freedom of expression, freedom of opinion, freedom of thought, freedom of, 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 of um, equality and, and non-discrimination. And really the, the entire business model um, is, is predicated on this um, hunger and, and you know, data mining uh, in order to, to collect as, as much information about us all um, through the cl our clicks, our likes, our fears, our dislikes, what, we, um, what we're interested in, what we buy, uh, to, in order to create profiles about us, which are then sold to um, advertisers or anybody who wants, to, who wants to influence us. And that's something I think that the, the social dilemma, the film beautifully demonstrates. Um, but the, the danger doesn't stop with, with that initial sort of um, data mining. The, the danger also then spills over to, you know, all sorts of de decisions about, um, you know, what kind of content that you see um, trying to influence who you vote for, um, profiling your, your health status and, and the, the risk that information about your health. And of course, we're all so much about our health at the moment. Um, that could then have an impact on your ability to access health insurance or, or other types of insurance. And really, you know, just coming back to your, your previous question about content mo moderation. Yes, it's partly about content moderation. It's partly about ensuring that moderators are adequately trained, that they're, um, they're adequately um, looked after in terms of their mental health and, and the sorts of trauma that they experience as well through the kinds of content that they see that content moderators are multilingual, that they understand the culture of, of the country in which they're, they're based. You know, Twitter still refuses to disclose how many content moderators it has around the world and what, what languages they, they speak. Um, that's, that's a really important point because as we saw with, with Facebook and, and, and Myanmar a few years ago, that can have devastating consequences when, when you know, people who un don't understand the language are moderating content. And, and also there are risks with, with automated content moderation. However, it's really important to note that um, 
that the content that we see on social media is, is based on a business model designed to attract and keep people's attention for as long as possible in order to get the most engagement. And, and the, the reason why um, these companies want a lot of engagement is that they can, they can hoover up as much data as, as possible um, about us. And then, of course, you have recommendation algorithms in YouTube that determine what video is going to play next or on Twitter, um, at, at curating the content and, and Facebook creating, curating your content and serving ads to you. And very often these algorithms amplify disinformation and divisive content and they fuel racism and try and influence our, our beliefs, beliefs and, and, and behaviours. And the reason for that is because it's likely to trigger people's emotions and keep them engaged for longer. So we can talk about content moderation and transparency and enforcement of rules and oversight, but we won't actually tackle the, the problem in a sustainable and long-term way unless we get to the business model and reform the business model itself. Because the business model is what is helping amplify this kind of um, content and, and which is you know, fueling, um, if you like, some of the things that, that, that we've seen happen in the offline world as, as well as the, the online world. And so it's really important to get to the, sor to the source and overhauling the business model would go a much longer way than, than you know, implementing um, better content moderation. Yeah, it, it brings me back to the clip we shared at the top of the conversation where Kathy O'Neill said that these algorithms don't predict the future, they cause the future. Um, and I think when we talk so much about social media, it sometimes distracts from the fact that there's a whole uh, broad ecosystem of technologies that are using these algorithms and these machine learning techniques to determine not just what information we see, which is what we're sort of familiar with in the case of social media, but all sorts of other real world offline outcomes. Um, so maybe going back to Sophia, I'm curious if you can help illuminate that for us. like. We touched on freedom of expression. We touched on, you know, what information you see. We touched on privacy. But what are some of the other sort of dystopian futures that these algorithms might be causing? Well, you know, I, it's been more than a decade now that I started studying kind of the information environment, um, looking specifically at Google. And, you know, obviously my book is mostly about Google, although it does talk about other um, companies and the incredible outsized control that they have over the future of knowledge, the future of information. Um, you know, I agree that we need to be thinking about you know, upending the business models and maybe thinking about new models, but, but partially what's at stake is that we have now become acculturated to private corporations um, controlling the information landscape to such a degree that um, we've really lost the public good. We've lost the kinds of democratic institutional counterweights, for example, that should exist um, in relationship to large advertising companies. Advertising companies like Google, Google Search, YouTube, um, you know, and other kinds of commercial search engines, people think of these as their trusted information portals. They use them like fact checkers. One of the things that I think is so incredibly dangerous is that while we have a lot of focus right now on social media, the public does understand to some degree the subjective nature of social media being a network of their friends and associates and people that they've accepted a relationship with digitally. Um, on the other hand, when you start looking at things like search engines, that might be a technology people use a dozen or more times throughout the day to verify reality to figure out what is the truth and what isn't. And this is, of course, a place where I have long tried to document the incredible harms and threats that poses because disinformation, racist propaganda, misogynistic content, homophobic content uh, calls for, um, uh, you know, uh, let's say disinformation about religious and sexual minorities uh, is propagated in those spaces because it too is profitable for those companies when people click through on it. So I think we're going to have to think about reimagining the future of knowledge and information 
Um, you know, I come out of the field of library and information science. So I believe, you know, we have thousands of years of the curation of human knowledge by people like librarians, other kinds of information experts, researchers, teachers, professors. Um, these are also part of the public good that has, quite frankly, been undermined and eroded by tech companies. I'm here in Los Angeles. I can tell you as a state employee for the University of California, as a UCLA professor, that the public now only invests 4% into higher education uh, in the UC system. Now, this partly has to do with the fact that comp you know, companies flourishing in Silicon Valley and Silicon Beach don't pay taxes. They don't pay back into the public coffers. They offshore their profits. And then they rush in and um, profit from the crumbling infrastructures that are mostly of their own making because they, again, have not participated in supporting the systems that we all need. So we need a real, I think, political economic analysis of the policies and the um, the leeway that's being given to tech companies and the tech sector. Um, they, it's, a, it's a fairly lawless industry that doesn't uh, have to meet the basic thresholds of responsibility that so many other industries in the world have to face. And I think that's part of the reckoning that is before us right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think if we've seen how a lot of these other industries um, have changed and have reformed over time, I suppose we can at least hope that we're sort of at the foothills of things beginning to shift and move and change here too. Um, Jessica, I was wondering, you know, we've talked a lot, a lot now about the harms, a lot about, um, how this is showing up in terms of human rights abuses. Can you give us a little bit of a lay of the land in terms of, um, how, how these platforms rank, um, how they, how they sort of rank among one another and what the average person should even be thinking about. Um, as they interact with these platforms and use these platforms to assess and think, hmm, maybe this platform isn't actually serving me. Maybe it's not serving the public good. Well, so we split our 26 companies into two groups. One is digital platforms that includes um, major social media companies like Facebook and Twitter. It includes Google um, uh, and, and and one of the and and then telecommunications companies like AT and T, Vodafone, um, and we've just added this year Amazon and Alibaba, and we um, rank companies all over the world. We're not just focused on the Silicon Valley companies or the Seattle companies. We also rank Baidu and Tencent in China. Um, and, and other influential platforms um, covering uh, half the world's internet or half the majority of the world's internet users, which is half the world's population, more or less. So um, can you remind me of your question again, Max? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Well, just given, given that sort of extensive um, survey that you do, um, I know maybe that you, you know, people will need to... Yeah, what, what's the lay of the land? Like what, not necessarily who's first and who's second, but what are the kinds of factors that you include when you rank them? And like, how should people be thinking about those factors as they use these platforms? Sure. So we rank, um, we have a, a pretty rigorous methodology that includes 58 different indicators in three categories. And those categories are governance, privacy, and freedom of expression. Um, this year's ranking, uh, we, we kind of talk about the fact that none of the companies would earn a passing grade in a university course, for example. Um, this year's results, I don't think any company, and I, I haven't memorized all of the, the stats yet, but um, no company earns over 60% across the board um, in the digital platforms uh, sector. In fact, um, Twitter took the top spot this year, one point above, I think, its closest competitor, but we sort of call it, it's the best of the worst. And it, it uh, ranked uh, higher this year because it had clarified a lot of its policies around content moderation in particular. And I think it's really important to note at this uh, that, that we evaluate policies and disclosures. We cannot evaluate 
practice directly. Um, and that's partially or mostly because the companies are so opaque in talking about their practices. So we evaluate what companies say in specific policies dealing with specific services in these three categories that I mentioned, governance, free expression, and privacy. And what we're seeing is that lots of, that companies are increasingly making explicit commitments to um, human rights in their governance, but they're, they're walking the walk, but they're not, no, they're talking the talk, but they're not walking the walk. They're not actually failing to implement these human rights commitments uh, in practice. And what we ask for um, in terms of governance in particular, which is an area that, that I think is incredibly important because your governance uh, should dictate how you operationalize um, the commitments that you make. But um, we ask, do you make an explicit commitment to human rights, to privacy and for expression? And then we ask a number of questions about how you operationalize those commitments in terms of having somebody with human rights expertise on your board, for example. Um, and having human rights at management level in, in, in different areas of your company. Do you conduct human rights due diligence um, on new products and services or even existing products and services um, before you uh, put, pull them into a new marketplace? Um, and what we find overwhelmingly is that most companies are, are not doing adequate human rights due diligence. And I think, I don't quote me on this, but very few or none do any human rights due diligence on their algorithmic systems and their um, target advertising systems, which is quite remarkable when you see how much sort of lip service has been given to AI and ethics. Um, we personally don't consider ethics, it's not a legal framework, it's not binding. Um, it's great to talk about ethics and AI, but it's not uh, it, even even that doesn't seem to be sort of trickling into um, the commitments that these companies are making in terms of what users or what people sort of who who we, we, we can't separate our online and our offline lives anymore. We are all subject to these machines and to these systems, whether we use them directly or not. Um, but what people, I think should really be thinking about is what kind of control do you have over these platforms, over your data? What are these actually honoring um, your sense, your, your agency as an individual using them? Can you turn off uh, your ability to, uh, or, or can you opt into targeted advertising rather than being forced if there's an option to opt out or just being forced to use it and clicking agree um, in order to, to use one of these platforms? Um, you know, I think user control is a big theme for us this year. Um, as I mentioned, uh, sort of improving corporate governance around human rights is a is something that we're asking people to think about um, and, and what they demand from these companies. Uh, again, and always um, we're pushing them to maximize transparency. Um, and we do this really painstaking work because um, otherwise there's really no other way to set a baseline. Um, other than to sort of say, what are the companies doing? And then from there, um, others can do technical auditing the way that the markup does um, with their investigative journalism and building tools to sort of be able to monitor what's actually happening on platforms. Um, or uh, we're you know, looking at strategic litigation and what kinds of evidence comes up in filings. Um, you know, we have to basically map around these companies to try and figure out what's actually happening. Um, and, and so those are the kinds of things that, that, that we're looking for. And also if, if something goes wrong, do you have some sort of pathway to file a grievance and ask for remedy? Do you know how you can get remedy from these platforms? I think all of these are unanswered questions. Some of them should be answered in regulation. Um, and, and some of them may not be, some of them may be answered for them with people who are, you know, working against, uh, the way things are. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's incredible how opaque a lot of these policies are, um, and yet how sort of frictionless uh, people, uh, how frictionless it is to put content on the platform that might be harmful, how frictionless it is to sign up, and how all those are sort of touch points in which we could be adding more transparency into the system and making these policies uh, more obvious to, to the user. So with that, I, I wanted to turn to uh, discussing solutions. 
Um, and solutions is sort of a tricky word in this issue, I would say, because um, we are still figuring out, you know, what a solution is comprised of, what would actually solve the problem. Um, but uh, Accountable Tech and Advocacy Group just released some data that I thought was pretty fascinating. It says that 71% of people want the U.S. federal government to implement stronger regulations on social media companies. So there's this push and pull, obviously, between these companies changing their platforms and, and taking measures to regulate themselves and ultimately needing, um, you know, regulation put upon them by by governments. Um, so for this, I wanted to pull from a question that was submitted uh, to by someone in our community. Ramsey Joyner um, submitted this question. Besides the Senate hearings, what kind of regulatory progress has been made? What interesting potential solutions have been raised or are being worked on around the world? Um, Rasha, do you want to take this one first? Yeah, for sure. Um, I can start by just maybe adding another issue, I think, which is which is important when we're talking about um, regulating the, the power of big tech. Um, I think, you know, we can't get away from their dominance. Um, Facebook and, and Google have, I think, combined two and a half, more than two and a half billion users around the world. So most people who rely on access to digital services rely in one form or another on Facebook and, and Google um, services. And so it's, um, I think you can't tackle the, the problem um, at its source without also tackling the, the issue of, of dominance. And there are you know, several antitrust hearings happening at, at, the, at the US level, um, in, the, in the EU. Um, there, is, there was scrutiny over the, the Google Fitbit merger. In Australia, there are, there are a series of, of antitrust investigations. So, you know, I think regulators around the world also recognize that the, the question of dominance is, is, is hugely, hugely um, in, important. And I think what is, is happening in the EU is, is, is quite exciting and, and potentially groundbreaking in, in the form of the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. Now, the Digital Services Act, um, which is currently going through, um, you know, consultations and, and, and will go through negotiations in future, um, lays down due diligence obligations for for tech companies and sets out rules on on moderation of poten potentially illegal content, including transparency obligations and and measures for the mitigation of, of risks posed by very large platforms, which are platforms like like Google and, and Facebook. And these um, these regulations that are being discussed will have a direct impact on on people's human rights, including people's freedom of expression. And similarly. The Digital Markets Act um, is, is more geared towards tackling this issue of dominance of, of, of these very big platforms. So looking at the competition in digital markets and um, you know, ensuring that there are other sort of privacy respecting alternatives that are able to emerge in the market and so people so that people can have um, you know, a, a real choice in, in which platforms um, they're using. Now, in terms of what kind of regulation is needed, I think the these, these two um, sets of, of, of regulations really paved the way for, for broader regulations around the world. And I think ultimately um, what's needed is, is that people need to have more control over what information is shared and what information is collected and used about them. There's also you know, discussion um, lately, very recently, of banning um, uh, targeted behavioral advertising which, you know, a couple of years ago would have seemed actually quite, um, you know, uh, far-fetched and, and, and radical, but actually it's, it's gathering a lot of support. You know, there's a, there's a coalition of MEPs here in, in Europe, um, which have set up a coalition, the Tracking Free Ads Coalition. And I think that's something that, is, that has to be on the table. Um, and it's, it's something that, that's, that's gathering pace. Um, but, you know, as I said, ultimately the question of, of dominance of, of these platforms needs to be tackled and um, giving users control over the types of data that's collected about them and how that's used. Yeah, I wonder as well if there is a danger, like it feels like there's almost this impulsivity at the moment within the regulatory space of trying different things um, and different, different groups, different countries trying to approach the problem in different ways. I know a few years ago in Germany, the, the, um, 
uh, I think it was called the Network Enforcement Act or, or NETS DG was sort of drawn up and, and really was around content moderation and taking down hate speech within 24 hours. Other countries within the EU are now sort of glomming onto that. Um, but a lot of people have said that this could actually have uh, do more harm than good. Um, so maybe moving Safia to you, like I'm curious if, is there a danger that we're going to take the wrong step? You know, it's going to be like a few steps back before we take a few steps forward. Well, I think one of the things we know from the current processes that are unfolding is that there is a lot of misunderstanding and, uh, you know, cultural misreading of m many of the things that come down off of the internet through content moderation processes. We see this in the United States, for example, when African Americans are targeted by racists, um, you know, whether it's a, a racist white neighbor or employer or a random person accosting them, and they report it out, share it out in social media. And because they named um, a white person as being racist, they're flagged and taken down. Now, because that's somehow reporting out on racism is being racist. So there's a lot of nuance here. And this is, of course, the kinds of things that people worry about when we talk about regulating speech online, is that we already have problems with not, uh, not doing it well, not understanding the kinds of um, nuances. It, it really is even beyond speaking a language. It's understanding kind of cultural context and cues, history, um, the social context, all these things are so important to making sense. Now, one of the things that, of course, we worry about is that regulators at the at the moment are just so far behind understanding. And at the same time that they are trying to kind of figure out things like speech online, they're adopting all kinds of technologies that aren't the everyday uh, name brand technologies that the public is used to, to make a variety of decisions. And of course, this is where we're talking about um, recidivism prediction software or uh, an algorithm to, that determines who gets the vaccine or how a vaccine is distributed. I mean, we're seeing many, many, many uses of technology and AI that far eclipse what happens in social media. And that I think is the space and the place where we're much more likely to see profound long-term systemic harm. Um, you know, the question that has been raised is, why is it that you don't have to seek um, approval through some type of regulatory body where you prove no harm, for example, from your product? Um, we're seeing, I think, uh, agencies like the Federal Trade Commission in the United States that are going to probably be more active. Um, Commissioner Chopra had been very active as the minority kind of um, opinion on that agency to talk about things like the pursuit of damages, um, the kind of financial accountabilities that these companies must have to the public. So there's a lot of different ways that I think we need to be thinking about the integration of predictive analytics into um, every aspect of our lives. And I think it's really insufficient, unfortunately, to just focus at the individual um, and you know, individual rights because, you know, this is a bit like saying um, people have a right to know what the air quality is in the place where they live or the water quality. And if the water is poisoned, you know, they should be able to have some damages. Well, you know, people don't control the quality of the air per se at an individual level. These are systems level, structural public policy questions. And I think that is a very important site of figuring out what kind of societies do we want to live in and how are we going to manage um, inside those values. Um, what we're seeing is a very well-organized effort to undermine living in societies where civil rights and human rights and sovereign rights are valued. We're seeing huge rollbacks in the United States. We've seen massive voter suppression. We see gerrymandering. We see every effort to disenfranchise um, black people, um, indigenous people, uh, people who have struggled and lost their lives just to be considered um, uh, equal citizens and participants in the society. These things are being actively rolled back. And I think we wanna think about, again, um, how are we going to, um, 
ensure that there is a civil and human rights um, uh, protections from a variety of these technologies that quite frankly, again, are just rolled out on the public. And then once we see the harms, we're talking about damages or we're talking about repair. I think we need to have a, a lot more on the front end before we get to um, the places of documenting the harm. You know, something that I, just to get a little meta for a second, something that I came across in the last week or so was actually an ad, um, I believe it was on Spotify, um, from Facebook about the need for regulation. And so a lot of what we're mm -hmm. starting to hear are these platforms calling for regulation, acknowledging the need for regulation, trying to seem, you know, uh, genuine and authentic in the fact that the only way that we'll be able to move forward is if there is consistent regulation that they then have to, you know, fall in, in line um, and, and address. Should we believe them? Like, are they being uh, disingenuous with this call for regulation? Jessica, do you have thoughts on that? I'm, I'm curious if the if these attempts at regulation or the need for regulation is, is coming up in your work. I know there was both the the index that's out now, but also the the report put out last year around the need to change the business model. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't pretend to know what's in um, Mark Zuckerberg's mind, but I, I take a fairly cynical approach to the idea that they don't somehow think that calling for regulation um, will ultimately benefit them and their business models, primarily probably because by sort of um, smoothing the way of the regulatory process or the legislative process, they have a huge opportunity to influence what comes out of it. Um, I think one of the things that has uh, been kind of mind blowing to me is that I think it's Facebook, Google, and perhaps a couple of other companies have, have spent more than half a billion dollars on lobbying in the last decade. Um, both in the United States and in Europe. Europe is now seeing lobbying from the tech companies at a, at a rate and at a, at a volume that, that's never been seen before in Brussels. So if they're calling for regulation, I have to imagine it's because they think that they can influence the outcome and the, they think that the process is going to happen anyway, so they may as well uh, look as if they are a part of it. Um, there was also a giant ad um, I think it was in the New York Times yesterday, a full page ad about, from Facebook saying that they're calling for regulation. If I'm not mistaken, I saw it go by on my Twitter feed. So, yeah, last year we produced um, a report that is kind of on the nose, um, a report series called It's the Business Model. Um, the first half of the series really tried to describe the different um, information algorithms that are shaping uh, content and uh, also... Uh, affecting content moderation um, and the vast amounts of data that need to be processed in order for these algorithms to, um, I won't say work, but to, to sort of function and, and produce outcomes um, that the companies want. And the second uh, report uh, happened to be timed right with the advent of the um, pandemic. Um, I think it's also really important to note that the pandemic, um, which we haven't touched on um, yet in, in the panel, um, has, by pushing everybody online, um, has increased the profits of these companies, um, increased their revenues and their profits um, to, to sort of uh, record, record levels. And so I think there's a huge disconnect there um, between sort of the the loss of livelihoods that many people around the world are experiencing and, and the huge profits of, of these companies. So in our, in our second report, it was getting to the source of epidemics and it really sort of looked at the disinformation environment that, that um, proliferated around COVID and the role of algorithms and targeted advertising and the lack of um, content moderation and effective enforcement um, in, in that scenario. And we produced several government, several recommendations for U.S. policymakers in that particular report. Um, and chief among them is something that Rasha sort of alluded to earlier, which is the need for federal privacy legislation in the United States. Um, we have no federal data protection or privacy legislation, and um, privacy increasingly is in, in our ability to control our data or, uh, um, yeah, is, is um, 
also affecting our, our freedom of expression. So um, it's affecting sort of how, con how content is moderated on the platforms and, and what it is that we see in our information ecosystem. We also believe that there should be a, a, a transparency in the ads that are being um, purchased on these platforms and, and who's purchasing them um, within, you know, uh, without putting people in, in jeopardy, of course, um, because also civil rights and, and human rights defenders purchase ads. But but to be able to have some transparency in the ad ecosystem and how much revenue these companies are actually generating from targeted advertising, I think these are all data points that we don't actually have, but would be very useful to having a real and informed conversation about what would the proper regulatory measures be. Um, and without sort of smart regulation or policymakers like their users who aren't informed about the way that these platforms work in more granular detail, what happens is, is we risk um, losing the benefits of these platforms, and they do have benefits, um, uh, and also losing our, our rights. Yeah, I think a, a theme that I'm hearing emerge is just going back to what Rasha said about the, the market dominance that these platforms have and the the lack of responsibility that we're then holding them to given the sort of dominance and the, the, the role that they play in our everyday lives. Um, we are starting to uh, wrap up here with only a little bit of time left. I wanted to quickly go to Rasha um, and share one more question that came from our community that was submitted by Livia Dantas in Brazil. Um, she asks, how can international human rights treaties adjust to a new era of emerging violations occurring in the digital world? Um, I know on our end, we've been in touch with all sorts of groups, including an interparliamentary task force that was started out of Israel to talk about um, with other you know, governments, how they can address um, hate speech online. How, how have you seen in your work um, that kind of cooperation happen and is that something that can happen here given the kind of consistency issues and the, the differing contexts that we're seeing in different countries that need to be addressed well wow, that's an incredible question big big <laughs> question to um look i don't think there is a i don't think there is an easy answer to this i think it needs to be a combination of things right i think having a, an overarching international treaty that regulates our digital rights is probably not going to bear fruit. It's not going to give us the strongest standards that, that we want, given the, the, the vastly different positions of countries around the world. Of course, you have progressive states like in the EU, um, the US is, is sort of getting there. Um, but then you also have states that are not progressive at all, um, like uh, China, India, Russia. And, and so taking an international approach um, would probably have more risks than, than, than benefits. But I know that that's something that some people are, are thinking about and it's it's worth thinking about. But but I personally think that that's not the right approach. I think the right approach is to look at um, regional based um, mechanisms and to look at national based um, laws, um, starting with, you know, pro progressive um, regions. Again, the, the EU being one of them, but there are there are also you know, specific countries that that also do have um, some some quite um, progressive data protection laws um, around the world. I'm thinking specifically of, of Chile, of um, of Argentina, of uh, Senegal, um, South Africa, and there are other countries. And I think looking at a at a sort of um, a, a national or, or regional approach is is probably the way forward. And I would also say that. You know, just because the EU is coming up with this framework, or this regulatory framework that would work in the in the EU context, that's not to say necessarily that that's a cookie cutter approach that can be applied to other other regions around the world. And then I think this is where, you know, we we this is something we haven't touched on as, as well as the is a disproportionate impact of of the harms and of the business model in you know countries in in the global south. So outside of, of, of you know, Europe and 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 the US, global south is not a perfect term. And I apologize for using that term, but I'm I'm thinking in in countries where perhaps there are not um, strong data protection uh, frameworks and where actually the, the tech companies, the big tech companies, profit from data exploitation and a term data colonialism that's been coined um, you know, through their practices of of 
you know, mining the data, knowing full well that actually um, the, the, there were lesser protections in, in, in those regions. And so I think we, we need to have a, a smart, um, smart mix of, of, of structural solutions, data protection, enforcement of data protection legislation, um, looking at this, the, the size and dominance of, of these companies, looking at antitrust measures, having more scrutiny over new mergers that are happening, like the, the Google and, and, and Fitbit merger, um, looking at um, other alternatives um, that, that um, could be used. You know, that this, this, um, the technology is, is not inherently abusive. This is a, a very deliberate decision that's been taken by these companies to, to put this business model in place and profit from it because it is so profitable and it's the most profitable business model. But that's not inherent in, in the technology itself. And there are alternatives. And I think framing it as, as not inevitable um, is is very helpful and and talking about you know the future that we want to see the the internet that we want to to enjoy our, our rights on um, is 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 really crucial because access to to the internet and respect to, to human rights are not mutually exclusive they're absolutely things that can coexist and it's just about um, pushing governments to regulate the tech companies where it's possible and and holding um, tech companies accountable when human rights abuses occur because they also have human rights responsibilities independent to the human rights obligations of states. Well, thank you for uh, kind of bringing us back to a, a, a more positive note. Um, and continuing with that theme, I wanted to just wrap up with one final question for, for all of the panelists. Um, in our last event, we um, we asked people what was giving them hope and sort of at the start of a new year, or at least with the bulk of a, a new year ahead of us, I'd like to pose the same question to all of you. Uh, what gives you hope for 2021? Uh, maybe we'll start with Jessica. Sure. For me, it's it's really that I see sort of a, a, a galvanizing movement um, coming together. Um, that, you know, has multi, it's multifaceted, many people working on the same problem of sort of corporate tech, tech companies domination of our public space, um, their kind of um, domination of our automated decision making, which um, I don't know what the boundaries of that are. Um, and, and so what we're seeing is we're seeing um, campaigns like Stop Hate for Profit be successful and galvanize um, more than a thousand advertisers. We're seeing uh, as soon as COVID tracing apps um, come out and are sort of proposed, privacy advocates um, really ready to respond and outline what all of the harms could be and sort of stop, um, in many cases, uh, the, the development of sort of these, uh, you know, um, of, of, of the app that's going to fix that, um, which, which it never seems to do. We're seeing uh, investigative journalism um, from the market, which I mentioned earlier, sort of doing some, some probing and mapping of, of how these platforms are actually working, that we can reconcile with what they're saying in their policies so that we can actually see what the gaps are between policy and practice. And so I see um, a lot of movement and, uh, and, and also the, the, the development of regulation, um, the, the Digital Services Act and, and, and other regulation that is a lot smarter um, and, and possibly the, um, the Section 230 uh, uh, with the civil rights um, uh, provisions, which I haven't looked at directly yet, but we're seeing smarter regulation um, come about. So I think there's a lot of hope. I think um, still, however, that that there's more work to be done. The social dilemma has started, and and others in sort of really articulating what what the the problem is for a broader group of people and bringing more people into the conversation. And Sophia, what's what's giving you hope today? What's giving you hope for 2021? Well, I have to say that um, you know I maybe I take a little bit of a a different position than you know some of the panelists. I think that many of these technologies are inherently discriminatory. They're not neutral. Um, it's not just a matter of the way the politicians deploy them. Um, they are predicated upon binary logics. 
um, in many cases. And, you know, the way that we do AI in the, in the United States and in Europe, in fact, is a little bit different than how it's done in other places with diff- different kinds of logics. So I, I guess I feel hopeful in some ways that we are, um, you know, there's now, uh, you know, many people and many organizations who are having these conversations. Um, I remember 10 years ago when talking uh, and arguing that, uh, technologies could discriminate all the way to the level of code. This was an unheard of idea. I mean, people just argued me down in conferences, said there was absolutely no way that code could discriminate because code was just math. And of course, now we have um, thousands of organizations and millions of dollars that are going into um, you know, new kinds of policy, uh, you know, think tanks and um, all kinds of sites uh, around the country and around the world where we can apprehend and actually talk about these things for what they are. So in many ways, I think I feel hopeful that it's not just the small handful of women, um, people of color, LGBTQ scholars and journalists, which it quite frankly was for um, a very, very long time, just up until uh, a, a very few short years ago. Um, that we're having these conversations. So we're in the mainstream now, these conversations are being had. I'm a little bit worried about the loss of the framing and a little bit of about the kind of ahistorical way in which people are kind of entering the conversations um, around the world. I think we have a lot to do. We have a lot to remember that these technologies, um, internet-based technologies are really about sequestering knowledge and science away from um, the non-aligned movement, the third world, um, in the 1960s and 70s as they were coming into existence. There's a lot to do to really understand what we're talking about when we're talking about the deployment of technologies that are creating um, massive, massive global inequality. And that inequality is predicated upon racial and ethnic lines um, in many cases. You know, we've been, every year we collect data on Um, rising global wealth inequality. And every year it eclipses the year previous. And the question is, in the face of that, we have these promises that the more data we have and the more technology we have, the less inequality we will have. And that's just not borne out. That's just not factually correct. So I think we're going to have to think about what it means to see um, parts of the world become uninhabitable because of uh, environmental catastrophe, the regulation of borders, who can move, who will have the right to exist and um, have high quality of life. Uh, It isn't that we don't have the resources on planet Earth. It's the way we've distributed the resources. That's the problem. And I will tell you that the tech sector has played a huge role in exacerbating these inequalities, despite the fact that people feel like we're more connected than ever. Um, I think we're going to have to do some real soul searching and we're going to have to look at kind of the truth of of history and the current moment. And, um, you know, I think there are more and more people who are interested in doing that. So that gives me an incredible amount of hope. Yeah, yeah. And I think hopefully uh, an awakening and an acknowledgement that we can't continue to offload these important decisions to the code um, so thank you for that. Um, finally, Rasha, any thoughts on what's giving you hope for the year ahead? No, I mean, I, re- I really agree with, with what Safia and, and, and Jessica have said. And I, I guess what I meant when I said that it's not inherent, um, to the, to the, to the technology, I mean that, um, you know, that the tech companies are saying that, you know, this internet is the only way that the internet can function. And actually that's not true. Um, we can have, you know, access to the to, to the to our to the platforms, and we can use Facebook services and Google services um, without having to be subject to, to surveillance. And I think that you know, tech companies have have peddled this narrative that actually that this is the only way that it can be, and it's not the only way that it can be. And it's and what gives me hope actually is that is that people are um, starting to wake up to to that fact and and pushing back against um, some of the, the the privacy abuses that they see. Um, perpetrated by by tech companies. A classic example of this is very recently when WhatsApp announced its its new uh, privacy um, policy and many people um, were outraged and and, and flocked to to other platforms like Signal and really pushed back against it. And so I think that gives me hope in the sense that people 
are pushing back against these um, these these sort of um, new encroachments of, of, of over their their privacy and, and their rights. And I think that the the social dilemma has actually done a, a great job of um, raising awareness about this this issue. And I think that people are better informed now. Of course, we have a long way to go in order to to make this issue relevant for for people globally and to to particularly to you know um, audiences outside of of Europe and and, and the US um, and to you know make make this issue something that um, is is relevant to, to organizations across the board not just digital rights organizations but also racial justice organizations um, and you know health organizations and and you know many many others um, because this this is something that touches everybody in 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 many similar ways but also many different ways and I think what gives me hope is the fact that there is this momentum now and there is this public consciousness and and a sense that um people are not just gonna accept what's what the the, the big tech companies are, are sort of enforcing on them well we echo a lot of those same sentiments here and I think I speak for the whole social dilemma team when I say that um, we are sort of heartened and have hope um, from uh, the, the little bit that we've been able to contribute to the that heightened awareness that we're seeing out there. Um, so with that, uh, we hope you'll join us in growing the movement that is, that is building by taking action after this event. Uh, we'll be sharing a few resources and ways to get involved on the screen, including checking out Ranking Digital Rights New Corporate Accountability Index that Jessica mentioned. You can also join our virtual tour by hosting your own conversation with friends, family members, or on behalf of an organization using our discussion guide. So thank you again to all the fantastic contributions of our panelists, Sophia, Jessica, Rasha. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. And thanks to everyone who's tuning in today. Thank you for joining us.